hard here so from uh from basic science to medical missions so uh, i don't want to think of too much time jeff uh, talking about medical missions causing harm or being good thank you dylan i appreciate your talk um yeah like dr spiker said we'll do a little bit more of a touchy feely topic at this point um so for those of you who don't know me i'm jeff franson i'm one of the fifth year residents and today i'm going to talk a little bit about my recent experience in el salvador with operation walk uh, to start, I'd just like to thank a number of people who are uh, integral in helping me fund, organize, execute, and analyze this experience. So this is my outline for this morning. Um, I'd first like to explain a little bit about what Operation Walk is, for those of you who don't know. Um, describe a little bit about my experience in El Salvador. Um, and then discuss a little bit about how we can avoid unintentional harm through our short-term surgical missions. And then at the end, I'd like to critically grade Operation Walk using the principles we learned. Um, so Operation Walk. Um, this uh, medical mission was founded by Dr. Larry Doerr in 1994. It's a private, nonprofit volunteer medical service organization. Uh, the mission of Operation Walk is to provide free surgical treatment for patients around the world in developing countries, as well as in the United States. The secondary mission of OpWalk is to educate the in-country healthcare professionals on advanced treatments, as well as surgical techniques for the disease of hip and knee pathology. Um, the objective of Operation Walk on each individual mission is to accomplish somewhere between 50 and 60 uh, joint replacements, as well as to provide education and training to those surgeons that are in country, as well as the surrounding medical professionals. Over the last 25 years, uh, surgeons have operated on over 10,000 patients through this program in 15 different countries on various Operation Walk missions. Um, in fact, uh, Operation Walk has expanded to 20 different chapters or teams across the US and Canada. So the Utah chapter of Operation Walk was organized in 2007 by Dr. Aaron Hoffman, and in total has gone on 15 trips, mainly to El Salvador. Um, El Salvador is kind of the, uh, the ideal location for an Operation Walk mission for a number of reasons. Number one is they have a huge need. Uh, there's over 700 patients who are currently on a wait list for a total joint arthroplasty. Um, they have an orthopedic residency there, so it gives us the opportunity to train uh, future um, surgeons that will stay within the country. Um, they also uh, have a hospital that we continuously work with, uh, that's their government hospital in San Salvador, um, and it allows us to be very efficient, uh, performing you know, somewhere around 60 total joints in four days. Opwak Utah also has Opwak SLC, uh, which every year they provide you know, 10 to 12 free joint replacements uh, here at the Salt Lake Regional Medical Center every November and December. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of how much it costs to execute one of these trips, I contacted the coordinator of our trip she said the cost this last year was somewhere around $225,000 with the breakdown that you see here. Um, doing just a little bit of simple math, however, it's a pretty good deal for joint. Um, it's about $4,000 per joint uh, that we replaced. If you compare that to uh, this receipt from a family member of mine that recently had a total hit done here at the uh, University of Utah, it seems like a pretty good deal. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit about my experience. Uh, so I was lucky enough to go on Operation Walk in uh, San Salvador, El Salvador this last September. Um, pictured here is Dr. Aaron Hoffman in the middle, as well as Kevin Purcell, who's a joint fellow at Duke and my roommate for the trip. We spent our time at the Hospital Nacional San Rafael. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on El Salvador, like I mentioned, San Salvador is the capital city. Um, it's a small country nestled between Guatemala and Honduras in Central America. Um, populations around 7 million people. Interestingly enough, in the early 2000s, they switched their official currency to the U.S. dollar. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea of kind of uh, the level of income of the country, their annual GDP is about 58 billion compared to about 21 trillion in the United States, uh, mainly with service, industrial, and agriculture. Uh, their major export continues to be coffee. 
Um, but if you know much about El Salvador, you probably know a lot about their crime. Um, so they have very big uh, kind of crime syndicates, you could say, the MS-13 and the Barrio 18. And in fact, in 2012, El Salvador had the highest murder rate in the world. Um, even earlier this year, there was a, kind of three days of gang violence that left 87 people dead. And so afterwards, President Bukele, who's their current president, he really cracked down on crime. And so he declared a state of emergency um, and got the police and army to start initiating mass arrests. And so since uh, March of this year, a little over 25,000 members of these gangs have been arrested. And he's really kind of cleaning up the streets of El Salvador. But in short, I think uh, if you take anything away from this slide is that if any country needs charity, I think El Salvador definitely qualifies. So in total this year, our group had 49 volunteers, mainly from Utah, Oklahoma, Texas, and Florida. Um, we had 17 MDs, uh, 15 surgeons and surgeons in training, an anesthesiologist, uh, one internist, three CRNAs, three PAs, 11 nurses, and 15 other uh, various volunteers. Um, at this point, Operation Walk is a well-oiled machine. Uh, nearly a quarter of the volunteers fly down two to three days early down to San Salvador. They assess our inventory, they re-sterilize equipment, and then they organize all the required surgical sets. Um, the storage shed that you can see here was built by Operation Walk on the hospital grounds in 2018 and holds everything required to fully supply a surgical mission. At the end of the mission, they'll go through an inventory of what they have left, and then they'll know what to ship down for the next mission. These are a couple of pictures of the state hospital where we held our screening clinic as well as performed all of our surgeries throughout our stay there. Um, so as we walked into the hospital our first morning, uh, all of our potential patients were kind of crammed into this big waiting room area. And it was, a, it was kind of a neat opportunity to, to come in and, and see kind of, I guess, the first part of their gratitude that they kept throughout their entire stay there. Um, it was interesting as we walked in, they, they would clap and cheer as we walked in and it was, um, it was a neat experience, but kind of a, a, an experience that gave me some mixed feelings. Um, you know, at first I was kind of proud and like, yeah, like, you know, I'm here to help you. But then I had like a little bit of a kind of a twinge of guilt. Uh, you know, maybe this medical mission was about us and inflating our own egos. You know, and why were people clapping for us when we were just providing a service that is kind of routine and normal here in the United States? But regardless, uh, we spent our first morning in the hospital doing a screening clinic. Uh, the orthopedic residents there um, had set up a list of 67 patients for us to do final screening on. Uh, we ended up counseling seven of these patients to continue non-operative management for the time being. Four were given intraarticular cortisone injections, and we indicated 51 for a total knee replacement and five for a total hip replacement. I understand there's a disparity in the numbers here. I asked several people while we were down there, and I don't know for sure, but we ended up doing a lot more knees than hips in El Salvador. It seems like it's a mixture of the pathology we see as well as what's just provided to us by the residents. After our screening clinic, we walked upstairs to the operative area. And I think the first thing that was really evident to me was that the San Rafael Hospital, which is their main government hospital, severely lacks funding, resources, medical supplies, and updated equipment. Um, there was a couple other ORs besides ours that were running, and it was impressive to see what the surgeons there were able to do with such limited resources. One thing that did not change from the US to El Salvador, however, was Dr. Pelt's intimidating stance while waiting on anesthesia. <laughs> Uh, so we take all of our patients to the preoperative area. Um, every one of our patients, we received the pivocane spinal along with Tylenol, uh, Aleve, uh, TXA, and Ansef, and if they're nauseated at, the, at that point, uh, Zofran as well. Uh, throughout the, the three and a half days that we operated, we ran three ORs. Each OR had their own individual team that had two attending surgeons, one American trainee, either a resident or fellow, uh, one San Salvadoran resident, a circulator, scrub tech, and a nurse anesthetist. Um, it was remarkable. We brought literally everything we needed to run the OR, down to the Bovi machine, the tourniquets, our gowns, our gloves, uh, exactly everything that we needed um, was, was brought by us. Um, and it was, it was an awesome experience. Uh, you know, I think uh, learning from different surgeons from across the nation is a great opportunity. Uh, it was fun working with the residents, um, and uh, I learned a lot, and hopefully I'll be able to apply a lot of these uh, new tips and tricks to the practice that I'll one day have. Um, I think one aspect of the trip that was super rewarding was working closely with the San Salvadoran residents. Um, this here on the right is Ricardo, who's one of the PGY3s that spent most of his time with us in OR1. Um, you know, one little tidbit is everyone fights to operate in OR1 because the AC in the hospital originates right by OR1. It goes through a single conduit through the ceiling all the way down to OR5. And so OR5 is pretty miserably hot and OR1 is awesome. <clears throat> And so uh, one thing that was also stark to me is the cases we performed, they weren't little chip shot cases, little simple varus knees or just a little bit of arthritis to the hip. Uh, we saw real deformity uh, and real disability. 
Uh, intraoperatively, at the end of each case, we gave each patient a gram of Vanco in the wound, 10 cc's of local anesthetic, and everyone got a hemovac drain for Dr. Hoffman. Uh, this is an example of a 48-year-old male. Uh, a few years prior, he was shot in the left hip. Uh, he was treated in traction and subsequently developed this pretty significant varus malunion. Um, he uh, had developed subsequent severe arthritis, as you can see as well. Uh, what was remarkable about this case is you can't really tell from these radiographs, but he had developed a huge amount of bone posterior laterally around the greater trochee. And so we pretty much had to reshape his entire proximal femur, uh, put a couple of cerclage wires to keep it safe, and then uh, we're able to put our components in and get him nearly up to equal leg lengths. This is another example of a 66-year-old female um, that had significant wear of her tibia. You can see a contained defect there on the lateral tibial plateau and an uncontained defect on the medial tibial plateau. After making our cuts, uh, we were able to just use some rebar screws and cement and use primary knee components on her with just a stem tibia. After surgery, our patients were taken to the PACU area slash pre-op area uh, where they had their operative ex extremity elevated and time was allowed, allowed for their spinal to fully wear off. Um, if needed at this point, they could receive either Zofran uh, or a single dose of Tramadol. We then took our patients to the floor where they uh, received the meds that you see here. Um, this year, for the first time, we were able to have stronger meds. So our patients were pretty happy about having Toradol and Tramadol available. In prior years, they would just have uh, Tramadol uh, PRN. Uh, while on the floor, our patients would be seen by our, uh, our internist, uh, our nurses, as well as our uh, physical therapists with the goal of getting each of them out the following morning. Um, at the end of each day, it was pretty rewarding. We were able to go around and round on our patients, interact with them a little bit, take some pictures with them, get to know them. Um, and we had several translators around to help with that, which was nice. Um, kind of a, a starting out on one of these rounds, though, I did have a slightly embarrassing experience. Um, as you see off to the left here, we all have these brightly colored robes on. And so, uh, you know, we kind of made the habit of making fun of them a little bit. And I, I mentioned to Dr. Bradbury, who was one of uh, the attending surgeons from Emory, um, that it was a little silly that we had to wear these robes around the hospital. Um, so the theory from the hospital is it would keep our, our scrubs uh, sterile or more sterile as we left the operative area. Um, but his response to me, I thought was pretty profound. He said, just because they do things differently doesn't mean they're wrong. And so I get that I, you know, cracked a, a little joke about how I thought that robes were ridiculous, but I think that statement stuck with me for the next couple of days. Um, and so uh, at the end of our surgery days, we also took some time to have a little bit of fun. Uh, we went around and ate at a couple of different restaurants. Um, and Dr. Pelt even figured out how to stream the football game uh, from his phone to his laptop to the bar TV so that we could watch the game. Um, and I'll say all in all, I think uh, my experience was excellent. Uh, I think Operation Walk, like I mentioned, is a well-oiled machine. Um, we bring all the resources we need and we provide excellent care for the patients there along with excellent follow-up. But um, several moments uh, from this trip stuck with me afterwards. You know, I think most of my moments are very positive, uh, like seeing the immense gratitude the patients had throughout their entire stay, uh, learning from surgeons across the country, uh, learning from the residents and the attending surgeons from in-country. Uh, I think creating relationships and having fun with other healthcare providers is very beneficial, as well as getting to, to experience a different country and just really being able to operate at time. Um, but I think some more thought-provoking moments stuck with me as well. Um, moments like that twinge of guilt I felt as I entered the hospital for the first time as patients were clapping, um, wondering if I was there for the right reasons. Uh, you know, a little bit of shame for mocking local customs like wearing the robes around the hospital and concerns for what type of follow-up care our patients would have after we left the country. So after digging through several articles on short-term surgical missions, I found this article by Welling et al. that's uh, cited pretty much in every article since this was published in 2010, uh, that describes the seven sins of humanitarian medicine. Um, so in order to create a good surgical uh, mission, I think first we need to think of ways in which we can fail or cause harm to our patients. And so I like this concept a bunch, and I think uh, it's the, the way I'll kind of uh, discuss uh, the remainder of my talk. So sin number one, leaving a mess behind. So I like this quote here. One good rule is to offer the types of procedures that are minimally invasive, relieve immediate discomfort, and require little follow-up care especially for missions that are short-term. And so as one who's pursuing a career in total joint arthroplasty, I think that uh, our procedures are fairly straightforward with excellent outcomes overall. However, complications can occur. And so we'll discuss a little bit about those complications and follow up in sin number four. Uh, sin number two, failing to match technology to local needs and abilities. This individual uh, here is uh, Christian Dupuy, uh, who's a Belgian plastic surgeon and he volunteered uh, throughout his career to go to Southeast Asia uh, for several months each year. 
Um, and this is a, a quote that he came up with where it says, I have seen professors from fancy American universities teaching endoscopy skills in Laos to internists who don't have access to an endoscope. And so if the center that we're going to with a medical mission doesn't have the technology or the ability um, or the resources to do the procedures we're doing, why would we go to that center? Sin number three, uh, the failing of non-government organizations to cooperate and help each other and to cooperate and accept help from military organizations. Uh, I think this sin doesn't apply to this trip as, as well, um, but uh, in terms of cooperation with uh, in-country um, organizations, I think a good example during our trip was uh, as we were coming to El Salvador, one of our reps came through uh, customs with two large suitcases, and in those were the majority of our implants that we needed for the, for the entire trip. And it got held up in customs and they, they seized them and said that we needed someone in country to vouch for us or else they couldn't come through because they couldn't quite understand what all this expensive metal was. Um, and so luckily, uh, Operation Walk has a really good working relationship with the hospital, uh, San Rafael there, and the medical director personally came to the airport with our team and they immediately released our, um, our implants and we were able to bring them to the hospital. Um, sin number four, failing to have a follow-up plan. Uh, I liked this quote here, so I'll read it. Surely we should never have one-time only missions. We should have an ongoing regular visit schedule. We should see our patients again and again. We should know and have ongoing dialogue with our medical colleagues in these countries. It is much better to pick one country and continue to serve it well than to hopscotch all over the world going everywhere and truly getting nowhere. So in short, go back to the same place. That's where we'll have the best outcomes, the best follow-up and the best ability to continue to train in-country orthopedic surgeons. This is a good article by Torsha et al. and JBJS in 2016, where they developed a kind of a pilot follow-up study where they involved 104 orthopedic uh, patients um, in Peru, I believe. Uh, and what they did um, is they created this data collection matrix where they had a standardized form that the in-country provider would fill out at certain time intervals, uh, specific photos that they wanted taken, and specific radiographs that were taken at the same time. These were all sent electronically to the surgeons from the short-term surgical mission trip and they were able to discuss the patients together uh, in kind of a more informed way. As you see to the right, uh, no one really does anything unless you incentivize them. And so they figured out a way to incentivize the uh, in-country um, providers to continue follow-up with higher pay uh, with longer follow-up. And via this program, they found that they had 82% follow-up uh, in a developing country. Um, and they had kind of the outcomes that you can see below that. And the mean cost of developing this program was only $20,000 per year. Uh, with 30% of that going towards the monthly salary for the in-country providers, 45% of that being the incentive-based pay, and 25% for patient travel and expenses. So this is a good example of, I think, you can develop some form of follow-up if you don't have the benefit like OpWalk has with uh, an orthopedic residency they're ready to follow up uh, on your patients. On to sin number five, allowing politics, training, or other distracting goals to trump service while representing the mission as a service. I think this sin kind of applies to larger medical missions uh, rather than short kind of surgical missions, especially those being carried out by like military, where the humanitarian efforts could be a guise for you know, a military ship to be in a country or uh, some sort of political reason. Um, but I think you know, uh, the point here is that the primary for focus of every short-term surgical mission should always be the patient. So I personally uh, took a photo of the face sheet of every patient I helped take care of uh, so I could remember them personally and remind myself of the primary reason why I was there. I understand I'm breaking a little bit of patient confidentiality, but I highly doubt you'll meet these people. Um, sin number six, uh, going where we are not wanted or needed and or being poor guests. And so like I previously mentioned, I think El Salvador is a, an opportune location just due to the overwhelming need for a uh, total joint arthroplasty with a wait list of over 700 people. They do have three uh, main local orthopedic surgeons at that hospital who perform arthroplasty as well as the residency. Um, but the, the need is overwhelming. And so Op Walk just really supercharges their pace for a few days every year. And I think it, it does a great service there. We do, however, need to be careful with uh, certain things, uh, such as local customs. Uh, the way that we speak, act, what we eat and drink is the way we're perceived by our hosts. Um, also understanding that just because we're from America doesn't mean we know better. There's a lot that you can learn from in-country orthopedic surgeons, especially in a resource poor environment. Uh, how to kind of call an audible intraoperatively and how to take care of a deformity that you don't really have all the fancy uh, balancing equipment or um, anything else that you need. All right, then on to sin number seven, doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Um, so I think there are several alternative motives that one would want to go on a medical mission. Uh, I've listed a few here. So, you know, the desire to go on a cool trip, 
uh, bragging rights for having done a first procedure in a different area. Uh, the desire just to perform a large number of complex cases quickly without needing informed consent, proper monitoring, don't have to worry about follow-up clinic, um, and then you know a way to somehow get an advantage in academia, whether it's to put something fancy on your CV or whether it's networking. And I think admittedly, I was able to network, I was able to learn from multiple surgeons, and I, I did receive a lot from this mission, but I think on top of it, uh, always having in your mind as you're at these missions that, you know, number one is the patients and improving their function and mobility. So I want to go on to an OpWalk report card where I try my best to harshly grade Operation Walk. All right, so sin number one, leaving a mess behind. So I think total joint arthroplasties, like I mentioned, are excellent surgeries. In general, we have excellent outcomes, but when we have a complication, they can be quite devastating. Also, when you go into a country and you perform 56 total joints in just four days, that can be pretty overwhelming to uh, the local system. And so uh, for that reason, I'll give us a B plus here. Uh, sin number two, failing to match technology to local needs and abilities. Um, total joint arthroplasties are being performed every day at the, um, in San Salvador at the San Rafael Hospital. And uh, we just kind of supercharged their pace, so we'll give us an A here. Um, sin number three, um, I think over the last 15 years of OpWalk, uh, OpWalk Utah has done an excellent job of recruiting dedicated surgeons, nurses, other healthcare professionals. And they have awesome relationships with the in-house hospital, administrative staff, uh, nursing, as well as the surgeons. And so I'll give us an A here. Uh, avoiding sin number four, having a follow-up plan. I think in general, we have a pretty good follow-up plan as far as surgical missions go. Uh, we're able to have them follow up with the orthopedic attendings and residents there. However, some do live a little bit of ways from uh, San Salvador, so they may be lost to follow-up, so we'll get a little minus there. Um, I think sins five and seven are similar. Um, and I think probably maybe the biggest issue I heard personally while on OpWalk, I think the majority of the people there were there for the right reason, to, to help the patient. But I do think that there were some uh, that were there to kind of collect stories or take pictures or uh, kind of just have the experience. But that being said, I do thank them for the amount of photos they took. Uh, they were very helpful in making this presentation. Um, and finally, avoiding sin number six. Uh, so El Salvador definitely has a need for us. Um, and there's uh, just a massive amount of patients still on that wait list. And uh, in my interaction with the orthopedic staff, the residents, as well as the nursing staff, uh, they were very grateful for us. So I'll give us an A here. Um, in the literature, this article by Bido et al. out of JBJS in 2016 uh, actually evaluated OpWalk Boston. And what they did is they, uh, over the years, they sent uh, surveys down to the in, um, uh, the in country providers, whether that was the surgeons, nurses, uh, residents and asked them what they thought uh, about Operation Walk as it came there and how it changed things for them. And so uh, the kind of overwhelming consensus of these surveys was that the technical and knowledge transfer led to sustainable changes uh, at this hospital. Uh, additionally, they noticed that there was an evolution in the nursing culture. As, the, as our nurses came down and showed them their independence and their ability to make decisions, they also emulated that and felt like they had a, a bigger say on the floor. Um, they did note that there were some barriers. Admittedly, I'm not bilingual in any useful language. Romanian doesn't help too much. Um, but uh, language can be a, a barrier wherever we go, as well as just the organizational hierarchy, um, not having the ability to interact with everyone that you would like to. Um, and then also, I think starkly, the U.S. participants noticed, it, uh, noticed that their practices at home changed as well, as they were able to learn from those in that resource or environment. So all in all, I thought Operation Walk was awesome. I think it is a great short-term surgical mission. Um, it provides excellent surgical care and follow-up. Uh, it's absolutely self-sustainable. So even though doing multiple surgeries can cause a strain on the environment, we brought a multidisciplinary team that took care of the patients from the time they entered the hospital to the time they left the hospital. Uh, we brought all the supplies that we needed, all the implants that we needed, and uh, we were able to educate the local orthopedic residents as well as have clear coordination with the local hospital. So these are my references, and I'd like to invite any questions or comments at this time. One quick question, Jack. So, so this is a well set up kind of well-oiled machine. If you're going to start something new, is there something that you learned from this trip for people who may have an interest in initiating something? Do you need one, one minute kind of tips or? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is first to protect.
And so that's how I think Operation Walk has become so successful is almost every new chapter starts with someone who has been on Operation Walk a few times and started to understand what that is. And so I think uh, the biggest keys from my standpoint are finding a place where there's a need, which I think can be difficult. Um, but as you get more involved in this world, I think it becomes evident uh, uh, through communication where there is a need. I think having a, a stable location uh, is, is key. And then I think, uh, you know, one point I didn't touch on that I meant to was uh, a success of a surgical mission uh, is usually based on its ability to provide everything you need in kind of one chunk, just like OpWalk does. And so if you have a desire to do a medical mission, you know, finding others with the same desire and creating a team large enough to successfully do so. If you take three providers down to a random area of the world, it's very difficult to have something sustainable and something worthwhile. And so I'd say step number one, learn how to do it well. Step number two, gather people around you who are interested in the same thing and then find a, a location that can be stable and sustainable. Yeah, thank you for yeah, I just want to make one comment. This is controversial. This is, it can be thought as medical tourism uh, or it can be thought as the greatest thing that cannot possibly have there. And um, when you go with a team and you're all pumped up uh, and everybody's got all the materials, it's, it's it cannot be anything but exciting and fun. If, if you say, could you use the same amount of money and resources to do good in another way? The answer is sure. You can, you train these guys, just send them the implants, let them do it. I would say a lot of money. Right? So I think that as you think about this business of you know, being humanitarian, which is a crazy term because you're not everything you do today. When you leave this room, is humanitarian. Okay, so the economy that this is humanitarian and what we do with it today is false, right? And everything you do as a doctor is humanitarian, and the the concept that you're going to give something somewhere else, but you don't give here. Is, is morally um, challenging, I think. and you you apparently were challenged by that because you came back and thought about it. And I, I give you full credit for thinking about like really what what was that? It was fun. You looked, you made some friends. You had you learned some got some tips and tricks and all that. But um, I think as as everyone here has the opportunity to do this, you should think about how does this how does this really fit into the evolution of the world and the practice of you, um, what are they really doing, you know, and they, as you'll see, everybody does say it's better to teach a man to fish than to be a human fish, right, and so part of it is always a bit of education, but when you look at the sustainability of that education, um, it becomes a little thin and questionable. At least that's, and I, I went into, uh, I went to Africa a couple of times and I sort of went away from it thinking, you know, am I really doing any good? And that's kind of, maybe that's selfish on my part. And every, there's many people here who are more than me, but um, uh, I think it's uh, morally challenging. Definitely, thank you. Perhaps I'm glad you're too easy a creator to don't have the money staff. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your talk.